This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much to my guest, Howard Storm. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. It's very nice to be with you. I am so honored to have you here. I have to tell you, Howard, I have had so many incredible guests on this podcast, but there's been nobody I've been more excited to have on than you because you have such an incredible story. Um, I liked your book so much, My Descent Into Death, that I actually bought an extra copy. So I had one to loan out <laughs> and one to keep because you know how you loan a book and then sometimes you don't get it back. So oh, I actually really have two of them. Yes. Yeah. And I also have your audiobook. So with all that being said, you have an incredible story. I'd love to have you share it with my audience. So can you take us to just before you had your near-death experience and everything that was going on? In 1985, I was 38 years old. I was raised as a Christian. We, we were taken to church, dropped off, you know, every Sunday. Um, I never saw any evidence of faith in my home. Um, you know, there was a old Bible on the bookshelf that was never taken off the bookshelf. And, um, on Christmas and Easter, when we had family, there would be a brief prayer before we ate. Um, that was it. Anyways, I was very enthusiastic about my faith until I, uh, 14, 15 years old. And that's a whole other story that I won't go into. But um, something happened that totally disillusioned me about um, the church, faith, my pastor and everything. So um, I, I stopped going to church, turned away from the faith. And uh, I found the answers that I was looking for in um, existentialism. So it's completely self-centered egocentric living. And of course that appealed to uh, a 15 year old, you know, um, in a very, very dysfunctional family. So anyways, when I went to college at the age of 17, um, I took my one, first semester, I took philosophy class and my professor was an atheist and um, I became his pet student. Uh, we became really good friends and um, absolutely convicted me of my um, um, making myself a god. That's with a small g, of course. And uh, that's how I lived. Um, when I became a college professor in 1972, I gravitated towards um, other atheists all, all saw in this um, new state of Kentucky with uh, not knowing anybody. All of my friends were college professors. They were all atheists and we all um, strongly supported our cynicism and um, I'm and our contempt, utter contempt for Christianity. And that's not uncommon in universities that um, many, if not a majority of people in public universities um, are atheists. And it suited me superficially. I would like to say that um, there was something hugely lacking in my life. And I um, then and now refer to it, there was a giant hole in my heart, a huge emptiness which I tried to fill with seeking fame, recognition, power, sex, domination, control. And by the way, that is a recipe for real success in American society. Anyways, June 1st, 1985, I was in Paris taking a group of students around Europe and 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, 
trying to get, it was the last day of our trip. The next day we were going to the airport to come home. Um, at 11 o'clock in the morning, I collapsed on the floor with the most acute pain I had ever experienced in my life. So I'm on the floor screaming, yelling, thrashing. And all I could think of was that someone had shot me in the belly. So my wife called the desk um, of the hotel. The doctor came very quickly, like within 10, 15 minutes. He got me off of the floor with a great deal of difficulty because I was um, immobilized with the pain. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. And uh, he examined me and he knew exactly what was wrong. And I had a perforation of the duodenum, which means there was a hole in my small stomach. And so what was happening was is that my digestive juices were leaking into my abdominal cavity and digesting me. So um, it felt like fire. It felt like I had a fire in my belly. Um, the doctor told me that I had to go to a hospital and have surgery right away, or I would be dead within an hour or two. The ambulance came. I had an amazing ride through Paris in a um, small ambulance going 70 miles an hour through the um, midday Parisian traffic, which was <laughs> very exciting. Taken to the emergency room at the big city hospital of Paris, Cochin, and examined by two very nice uh, female doctors who confirmed what the doctor said. And when um, I inquired about stuff, they said, you have to have the surgery right away or you'll be dead in a short while. Um, by the way, I've talked to a bunch of American doctors about my situation. They all said, yeah, your life expectancy was about two hours, maybe three at best. Um, it's in pretty bad shape. So um, they put me on a gurney and wheeled me out of the emergency over to the surgical hospital. Now, this was a Saturday. And because of socialized medicine, which I'm not a fan of because of my experience, um, there was no surgeon available to do the surgery. So when I went to the surgical hospital, I was not signed in by a doctor. I was put in a bed in a room, but not on, no, no doctor, you know, signed off as there was no doctor. I didn't have a blanket. I didn't have a pillow. I'm just laid on a bed and left there. Now, the pain that it started off more than I can handle um, gradually got worse and worse and worse. And about every hour, a nurse would come in and, um, you know, Sivam, Mr. Storm. And I'd say, you know, I'm, I need a doctor. I need. I need morphine. I need, you know, I need something. You know, the pain's unbelievable. She would say, you know, oh, um, I'm so sorry. You know, there's no doctor available. We can't give you anything. Cut to the chase here. Um, well, before I do, I just want to say that the pain got so bad, it was almost impossible to breathe because when you breathe, you move your diaphragm. Now, the pain that I was experiencing was from my shoulders to my groin. Um, red hot fire, okay? And I'm not exaggerating or dramatizing. I mean, that's what I was experiencing. So to move my diaphragm to breathe was um, very painful, except that I was, my mind said, if you don't breathe, you're going to die. So 8.30 that night, this started at 11 in the morning. I was at the hospital, um, you know, before noon and I've not seen a doctor. I've not been given any pain medication. One of the things that drives me crazy when I tell my story, people always say, oh, it's just all the drugs you gave you. It's like, oh, thank you for your insight into my condition because I was given nothing as in no thing. Um, the nurse came in at 8.30 and said, 
They were very sorry. They were unable to locate a doctor. They would try and find one the next day, Sunday. Well, she didn't say this, but what I heard was ready, aim, fire. You know, this is over. I can't do this any longer because it was incredibly hard to breathe. Um, the uh, nurse left the room. I called my wife over who was sitting in a chair next to me and I told, I've got to abbreviate this because some of the stuff gets a little too emotional. I told her, tell my parents and my sisters I loved them. Tell my friends I loved them. I love you, dear. Now it's time for me to go. And she cried like I'd never seen her cry before. And she sat down in the chair with her head in her, head in her hands. The last That's the last thing I saw. And I didn't want to see that, so I just stopped breathing. And I went unconscious. Another question that I get asked, and I've, I've given my talk a lot of times, so I'm anticipating some of the questions. People say, how long are you unconscious? It doesn't really matter because the thing that people don't understand that near death experiences have a great deal of difficulty trying to explain to people is there is no time outside of this world. So, um, I felt I was standing up next to the bed with my hospital gone, gone on, feeling better than I'd ever felt in my whole life. And I heard people outside the room saying, hurry up, let's go. We've been waiting for you. And I said to them, are you from the doctor? Because I need to have an operation. And they said, we know all about you. We've known everything about you. It's time for you to go. Don't ask questions. Let's go. Now, I couldn't see them because the hallway was dark. And the room was bright, lit. And so I was, hmm, I had a bad feeling about all this going from the light into the dark with this group of very um, officious uh, people yelling at me. So I left the room and I went out and there was a number of them, maybe eight or 10 of them. I don't know. It was dark. I couldn't really see them. They were all adults, men and women. And this way, this way. So they surrounded me and led me into the darkness. Now, as we walked and this journey went on for a very long time, um, One of the things I realized was we never hit stairs. I never found a wall. It was just a plane of darkness with no other than the floor. Um, it was clammy, um, a little bit warm. But one of the things that distracted me was the tone of the people around me, which went from um, commanding me to do this and that to them getting ugly um, and saying things that were very disturbing. Like, you know, I only had a hospital gun, which of course didn't cover my backside. And people were talking about my buttocks and how attracted they were to them, which was very disturbing, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, we're going to have fun with saying things like we're going to have fun with him, you know, stuff like that. And like, mm, this is bad. So after a very long journey in the darkness with these people, I, I had it with them. And I said, I'm not going any further with you. I'm going back, which was a bluff because, of course, I had no concept of which way was right, left, forward, back because I'm in pitch black. And so they started grabbing me and pulling me. And so I fought with them and we fought and fought and fought. And it began with kicking and punching, but there were a lot of them now, maybe hundreds. I don't, I mean, I'm just speculating. Um, it degenerated into them, um, plucking out my eyes, um, 
invading my ears. I don't, I don't like to talk about this at all. Invading my every orifice violently. And then it went from that to them eviscerating me. So that's enough of that. Um, I'm laying on the floor, on the floor ground of that place. And there's a number of people around me and occasionally they were kicking me, but I couldn't react anymore. I, I was physically, emotionally so exhausted. I had, I, all I could do was just little moans. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, I had no fight left in me, no response. So, um, laying in that place, I thought about my life and what I, and I'm not going to go through all that. <laughs> that, would, that would take hours, but I thought about my life. And what I concluded was my, I was a fool and my life was meaningless. Basically, I was a little fish in a little pond as an artist, as a college professor, you know, basically I had deceived myself into thinking that I was something that I was not. And there was no point to my life. My life was just a bit, been a big um, delusion of my grandiosity, you know, um, which I realized that the people who had escorted me and attacked me in this place were my kindred brothers and sisters. And what was happening to me was that I was being um, processed into their world, which was a world of cruelty and hopelessness and domination. And it occurred to me the only way that if I could ever get ambulatory again was that I had to become crueler and more dominant to keep from being a victim. Because there were basically two kinds of people in this world, the, the uh, victims and the victimizers, you know. And I, I assume those roles probably changed frequently, you know. Anyways, that was their world. Now, I refer to this place as hell. Um, my best friend was a Catholic priest, and he, he said, it wasn't hell, it was purgatory. Uh, you know, which I don't, I think he's wrong, quite wrong, but that's another long story. But anyways, um, he meant well. Uh, so I'm lying in that place with no hope. I did not want to be there. I did not want to become one of them. Um, mine went to me as a boy in Sunday school, singing Jesus loves me. And when it did that, I could see myself in Sunday school with the other kids singing that. But most importantly, in my heart and in myself, I felt that. That Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells I hope your viewers know that song. <laughs> I think most do. Um, and I wanted that. I wanted what I had lost 30 odd years before, or what I had 30 odd years before, which I lost when I was uh, 15. And with all the strength I mustered, I called out, Jesus, please save me. The uh, people that were around me were horrified that I had prayed, but they retreated back into the darkness because a faint light appeared in the darkness and became very bright, very fast. If that light were light as we know light in this world, it would have consumed me. I would have 
been fried to a crisp by that light. It wasn't that kind of light. It's a different kind of light. And it felt wonderful. And it came over me. And I was very aware of a presence in that light. And out of that light came hands and arms, reached down, touched me. And when he touched me, now in that light, I was for the first time, I was able to see what I was. And I was, without exaggeration, I was roadkill. You know, um, all of that melted away and I was restored without the hospital gown. Um, and I was filled with a love that there is no way to describe the magnitude and the wonderfulness of that love with any words we have in English, except beyond description. And his hands and arms reached underneath me and picked me up and he lifted me to himself and put his arms around me and held me very tight against himself. I put my arms around him and held him like I never was going to let go. And I cried into his chest like I'd never cried in my life. And I'm talking slobber. And I kept thinking, oh, this is so embarrassing. I'm just slobbering all over, <laughs> you know. And I can't talk because I'm acting like a, a baby, you know. And then I realized something weird was happening. We were going up. I didn't even notice the list, the lift off because it was so gentle. But I did notice we are going up and up faster and faster and faster. And we're traveling at some great rate of speed. And I got enough composure together to stop crying and to look up to where we were going. And my first impression was it was a huge galaxy of light. Except that one of the things I noticed was a lot of those lights were um, coming and going, which stars don't, <laughs> you know, stars don't come and go. They, you know, they're pretty stationary. And uh, I don't, I didn't know what to make of it. And I said to my new friend, we had not spoken yet. I said to him, um, you've made a terrible mistake. I don't belong here because I knew that where we were heading was a good place, a really good place. Um, you know, I had a suspicion it was heaven. <laughs> Um, and, uh, we stopped outside of this world of light and he said, we don't make mistakes. You do belong here. Now, when he spoke to me, he spoke in his voice directly into my mind. It was not audible. Uh, but I heard him in his male mature voice very clearly. And I said to him, how do you know what I thought? I didn't, I didn't say, I don't belong here. You know, you made a mistake. Um, and he said, I know everything you've ever thought. And with that, I had a huge, uh-oh. And I began to think, oh, there's lots of things that I've thought that I don't want him to know. And he started laughing and laughing and laughing. <laughs> and he said, it's okay. I know everything. And so we began to converse. And he was very charming, had a great sense of humor. Um, I was crystal clear that this was Jesus Christ. 
later on that was confirmed over and over again. But anyways, um, we, we were having a great time. And he said, I have some people I want you to meet. So he called out in musical tones and a group of what I refer to as angels and what I now understand. They were my guardian angels because um, I don't know if people know that, but we don't have a guardian angel. We have a team of guardian angels, all of us. They came over and one of the first things they said to me, would you like to see us in human form? And I said, no, I hate people. I never want to see people again. And so they just uh, maintained their appearance in brilliant light. And they had, they were um, different kind of colors going on in their lights. And um, they said they were going to show me my life. So we did a life review. It was a terrible experience because started off as a child, all happy and fun and stuff like that. But as my childhood proceeded, it got um, worse because of a very dysfunctional family, a very abusive father. And I just, um, my, my way of coping with that world was to just withdraw in myself. I didn't, um, I kept my distance from other people and emotionally, I didn't get involved with other people. People were just things for me to manipulate and move around. Um, worked, worked well for me as an adult, you know, um, on a materialistic level. I was successful. Um, anyways, they expressed, and more importantly, Jesus expressed his disappointment with my life. He never criticized me, but he literally wept over my life. I was breaking his heart because that's not what I or any of us are born for. We're born to be children of God. You know, to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves, as Jesus said in the scriptures. That's what we're born for. And I, I wasn't doing any of that. I didn't love myself. I didn't love my neighbor, and I didn't love God. Um. I asked him repeatedly, okay, I've seen enough. I don't want to see any more of this. And he said, no, you've got to see the whole thing. So we watched the whole thing. Now, when I said I saw my life, they showed me episodes from my life. They did not show me every second of the 38 years of my life. They just showed me the critical episodes. You know, sitting at the coffee table with my mom, um, you know, interacting with my father. And a lot of things I learned, like... Um, Jesus showed me how my father had become the person that he was from his father was an extreme alcoholic and a very dysfunctional family. So anyways, um, I had a lot more understanding and sympathy for him, even though I hated him, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, but one of the things that I saw is that everything we do has repercussions to the person that we interact with. It's like that saying of the ripples in the water, you know, when you interact with someone, it has a ripple effect out there. Um, anyways, when that was over, Jesus said to me, do you have any questions? And I said, I have a million questions. So that's what we did. I asked him my million questions. People asked me, how long did that take? And I said, oh, much longer than I was in graduate school, which, by the way, was three years. Um, I asked him everything that I could think of to ask. Unfortunately, um, with my ignorance about Christianity, there's a lot of things that I wish I had asked <laughs> that I didn't ask. But anyways, he answered my questions. And then when we were done, 
and by the way, I'm, I'm getting to the conclusion here about my experience. Um, I said, I want to go to heaven now and be there forever. And by the way, he had given me a tour of heaven. I was never in heaven. I got a tour of heaven. We were there, but I was not hard to describe. I was a tourist. You know, like when you go someplace and you don't, you don't belong, you're just a spectator. That's what I was given a guided tour by Jesus. And uh, heaven's a wonderful place. And any living creature from the smallest ant to Albert Einstein would want to be in heaven rather than any place else because it's wonderful. Um, and Jesus said, it's not time for you to go to heaven. And he said, literally, you don't have the character you won't fit in. You've got to go back to this world and try and live differently. And then you can go to heaven. Um, we had a huge argument. And I threw every argument I could about why he shouldn't send me back to this world. And every argument I came up with, he calmly, patiently, rationally explained to me the flaws in my arguments. And I'll just give you one example because this went on for a long time. I said, why would you want me to put it back, put me back in that world? It's full of cruelty and ugliness and, you know, horrible people. And he said, true, there are those, but there's also good people, loving people, kind people. And I said, well, I never met him. I didn't know him. And he said, what's in your heart is what you will attract. And you know what? That Jesus guy, you know, he's always right. He's you know, this experience happened to me almost 40 years ago, and uh, it, it, it's true. What's in your heart is what you attract. Um, if you seek loving people, you'll find loving people. If you seek cruel people, um, there's plenty of those around too, and you'll find them. Anyways, finally, um, he defeated all of my arguments which are actually kind of interesting because gave me a lot of insight into this world and guidance on how to live here. Um, and I agreed to come back. And when I agreed to come back, blam, back in the bed, back in the pain, back in the hospital, it's now nine o'clock. And the nurse who had been in there at 8.30 said they were unable to find a doctor, came rushing into the room, all excited. A doctor has arrived and we're going to prep you for surgery, which I had sometime around 10 o'clock that night. Um, in conclusion, the next morning I'm lying in bed knowing that the most important thing in my life had happened to me. And I really felt like it was more important than being born because now I knew what I was born to be and do. And... I realized that I was going to have to do a big makeover of me. Now, I'm 38 years old and I'm this proud, arrogant, you know, son of a gun. And basically, I knew I was going to have to um, tear it all down and build something else, which nobody wants to do that. <laughs> I had 38 years invested in this, you know. But that's what I've been working on for the past almost 40 years is becoming a new person. And um, what that means is following Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and being a kind, uh, caring person whenever I can. I just want to live a life pleasing to God. And Jesus had told me in the argument, that's all God wants. Just try and live a life pleasing to God. He, God does not expect perfection. Um, God knows how imperfect we are and how we will make mistakes, but God has also provided us a way to achieve forgiveness and reconciliation, you know, through 
confession and repentance and asking for forgiveness. Um, so I'm going, um, me and a bunch of other near-death experiences call heaven home because that's where we belong. That's where we came from. That's who we are. And that's who we were born to be, you know, life in heaven forever and ever. And I'm looking forward to the day that I go home. But I'm trying to make the most, make the best out of um, the situation that I'm in. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you so much, Howard. You have such an incredible story, and you've had a remarkable and beautiful turnaround. And you have dedicated your life to so many good things since then. I have a lot of questions for you. I want to talk about some of the questions that you asked, some of the answers that you got. I'd love to talk to you a bit more about religion, uh, the future, also even like alien life and other worlds. I've got all kinds of things that I would like to discuss. So we will take that into the next episode. Thank you. Howard. Right. Looking forward to it. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. I have been wanting to have Howard on for a long time. I think his story is so fascinating. It is so unique compared to many other stories that we have heard. And I'd really love to hear your thoughts on it. What did you think? Please share that in the comments. If anything stood out as really remarkable, go ahead and, and mention that as well. And then also, if you made it all the way through the end, as you know, I love to hear that. So please just put made it in the comments. I also appreciate it uh, to all of you that have subscribed. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this with your friends as well. And, and I certainly appreciate those likes too. So thank you everybody for being here. Please stick around. We've got three more really great episodes and we cover so much. We are going to talk about religion. We're going to talk about hell. We're going to talk about heaven. We're going to talk about other life forms and aliens and also some of the things he saw for the future. So please come back for more. Thanks so much for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. That was part one. Make sure to listen to part two. And if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more episodes.